afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Real Bravo Fine Art Gallery. I'm Terry Jagger Gustin. I'm your current Arts Council President. And this afternoon is the first lecture in our 2024 lecture series. Our guest is one of our own, serving as Arts Council Board Secretary. She grew up in Minnetonka, Minnesota, and has lived in TUC for over 25 years. A fiber artist, a graphic designer, and a tarot reader, she attended St. Cloud State University and has worked freelance for 25 years in graphic arts and advertising arts. Lastly, she's the graphic designer for our very popular artist directory. Please, a warm tear see welcome for Rebecca Speaks. Well, thank you, thank you all, and welcome everybody for coming to the Art Talk series. It's the seventh annual Art Talk series. And I want to thank um, Eduardo of Rio Bravo and, um, and Richard Gutierrez, and also, of course, Jagger and Susan Bueller and Andy Underwood of the Arts Council for, for all helping today. So, I, I want to start out by saying that I love color. <laughs> I just really love color. And also design, putting them together. So, um, that has really been my inspiration over the years. I think there are a lot of things that have inspired me. A lot of things in nature, colors, um, combining different colors. I just really love it. And I love looking at the mathematics of, of good design and wondering how colors and designs can be changed into something I've never envisioned before. I remember when I was about eight or nine, I said to my mom, you know, I just really love pink and orange together, the colors of pink and orange. And she said to me, well, you know, um, those colors really don't go together. <laughs> <laughs> it was in the 50s, and people were kind of conservative about things, and they had their preconceived ideas of things like colors that were together. But I still, uh, still love pink and orange, and they really come into my artwork quite often. So the challenge of putting colors together continued to grow. And when I started making quilts, often I would pick two colors for fabrics that really didn't go together. But the challenge was to choose more colors to combine into a blend where those two colors did make sense in that, that blend. So uh, I was an only child, and I love being an only child. Um, I had a lot of time to myself to, all, to do all my projects, to knit and sew. Uh, did a lot of gardening in our family's vegetable garden. And my mother and grandmother, whom I grew up with, as well as my grandfather, uh, they did a lot of uh, knitting and sewing and, uh, and crocheting. Uh, it was my grandmother who taught me all those things because she was right-handed, just like me, and my mom was left-handed. So they figured between the two of them, so was they, the, my grandmother would teach them how to do all those things. Um, let's see, maybe we should look at some of the slides. So this is uh, a quilt that I finished in 19, 84. It's one of my earlier quilts. Um, it's called Arctic Spring, and it's part of a series that I did with the, uh, the background, or the, the background color and geometric shapes worked into that. Next. Okay, so this is uh, from the 70s. Second half of the 70s, I really did a lot of crocheting. Well, actually, all of the 70s, I started out doing hats and, and afghans and hot pads. And then uh, about the middle of the 70s, I got into crocheting clothes. I would design them and cut out the shapes of the pieces that uh, would go into the garments 
usually out of newspaper. So I would have that shape of each piece and crochet uh, the shapes to the uh, newspaper shapes. And then uh, when I was all finished, then I sewed the pieces together into the garment. Uh, and a lot of them have um, designs on them, colors worked into the garments that are, um, because it's crochet, they're all linear or zigzaggy. So I continued to do that for about six years and realized that um, uh, kind of like to have more flexibility of, of um, design. So I thought, well, what, are my, what am I going to do instead of crocheting? And then I thought, oh my gosh, quilting <laughs> has a lot more flexibility. You can have the diagonals and even curves and um, really more colors because with fabrics there's more colors available than in yarns. But then I almost rejected studying quilt making because I remember back in junior high and home ec that I didn't like sewing clothes. Just really didn't like it. But I thought, well, I'll take a quilt making class. And I did. I took uh, several um, through the local quilt store and then also through the adult education classes. Um, Minneapolis Public School, night school. I took a uh, semester long quilt making class where you made all these different um, sampler shapes, your sampler patterns, and I sewed them together into pillows. I've been making pillows off and on for a long time. I was um, a graphic designer and I worked alongside other graphic designers and they used a, a grid pattern to design on like brochures and annual reports. First they would design a grid pattern on which they would put the, uh, the elements, the design elements like photos and type. So that's where I got the idea to, um, to design my quilts over a grid pattern. So I started out with a, the grid pattern, the lines would intersect at a 60 degree angle, which yields a lot of equilateral triangles. And, and eventually I thought, well, how about 65 degrees? <laughs> that might really yield some interesting shapes. So that's really what I ended up with, although I, I did experiment with uh, 
70 degree angle, but, and that makes some really elongated or pronounced shapes. But most of my patterns are designed on a 65 degree angle grid pattern. So we'll get to that point, there's a slide of that too. So this is uh, from 85, it's called Mercy on Broadway, and that's the title of a, a Laura Nero song way back in the 70s. And that, that one is downstairs, you've probably seen it. And, uh, so that's from uh, 85. All of my quilts are hand quilted. And I've made 336 quilts <laughs> so far. <laughs> and you can also see on that one, so that comes out of this, there's stripes. Stripe pieces, white fabric with black stripes on them. Um, and those, those stripes I drew on the white fabric with the black stripes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I just have this fascination with um, stripes early on. So I, I drew, but then as I mentioned, it, it faded in time. Um, the sun faded the permanent markers. So eventually I started sewing stripes together with strips of fabric. You've probably seen a lot of those downstairs. Okay. This is an old piece too, it's from um, 84. That year I made um, six quilts, six large quilts, 1984. This is called um, Caramel Apple, the brown one, Caramel Apple. And this one is called Neon, and that's, uh, I think that's from 92. Um, I had gotten into a different type of design method where there were waves of uh, each repeat went up and down twice. And each repeat had 13 pieces in it. Huh? That was the specifics of the design style that there were 13 pieces in the repeat. And I drew on the fabric here too. And the, these green pieces have kind of um, wavy lines. That one's called neon. And this is uh, another quilt using that same design method of using the 13 pieces to go up and down, up and down. Yeah, this is one that's called Fool's Gold. Fool's Gold. Uh, this one is um, Lemon Chiffon, and that one's downstairs too. It has uh, the stripes that are sewn together. Here and here. And this, this is one of my favorites, I love the colors. And there's chicken orange in it. <laughs> Vineyard. It's a triangular quilt. And I was posing there. Um, my office mate at the time was way into photographs and he had me pose in our in our office with that around me. Vineyard. This one, let's see, um, this one is cool fire. Or not cool fire, oh, Yule fire. I designed it during a December up there in Minnesota, and, and you know how the dreary the colors are up there around Christmas time in Minnesota, so that's why it is so kind of dark and moody and almost kind of depressing. But uh, yeah, it's got, it's got the, um, the stripes in it here too, in here. Are they sewn? Those are sewn stripes? Yeah, there's some samples out there. Yeah, that's really the only way to get the two exact colors. 
or pair of colors that you want in the design because you just can't really go out to the fabric store and find exactly the color stripes material with the width that you want. Mm -hmm. So I, early on I realized I'm just going to have to make my own stripes. So this is a grid pattern at a 65 degree angle. The, the lines cross each other at a 65 degree angle. So I would um, draw a grid pattern on a piece of vellum, which is kind of like a hard tissue paper, and then lay another sheet over it of vellum and then start drawing a design using those guide lines. <laughs> so here's an example of a finished uh, pattern, quilt pattern, um, with a pattern drawn in and then the uh, colors were brought in with a um, color pencil. I would choose the colors that went into the quilt and then um, just test it out, coloring in a portion of the pattern. How long would that take, that process? Uh, it took two days to design, and I think a little bit extra for the, the um, color pencils, because then I had to go home and pick out the color the fabrics. So here's a, a process shot where I've already cut out the pieces, and then started to pin them together. The pieces are made with uh, using a, um, <coughs> plastic templates, hard pieces of plastic cut into the shapes of the uh, quilt pieces. And then I would turn the fabric over, backside up, and then put the uh, template piece on, and then trace around that, and then cut them out with the scissors. And so the pencil lines become the guidelines for sewing. Here's a quote coming along. <laughs> and here's one, I think this one's downstairs and it's, um, that's half. Here's a, a photo of my back porch with the sewing machine. It's a featherweight. And just kind of a shot of the mountain mounds. I have two featherweight sewing machines. One of them was my grandmother's. She had one. And I kept borrowing it, so my grandfather said, you know, you should just go buy your own. So I did. So now I've got two. It really is handy because I keep in one of them I keep white thread and the other one I'm, I have gold thread. So when I have to switch colors of thread, I just switch the sewing machine, plug it into the plug. Each one goes into the same plug. <laughs> so I, here's a strip of the stripes that have been sewn together. So I sew it together and then uh, iron it, press it flat, and then use that just like a piece of fabric and um, cut the pieces, the quilt pieces out of that. Yeah, here's a finished piece. I think it's Black Mesa, I think is the name of it. Flash in the pan. <laughs> I think a lot of these are downstairs hanging. And all of these are the same pattern. It's the pattern that I use the most, as I mentioned, like at least 90 quilts I've made out of this pattern. Just at different shapes, different angles, different colors, of course. It's just such a wide variation. And 
people don't realize they're all just all the same pattern. <laughs> This is another one with uh, beads on it. That one's called Kiwi. Are these printed fabrics, Rebecca, or? Yeah, they're batiks. Yeah, I just use batiks. Lamaze, treacle lamaze, and um, um, and chintz. The, the, the solid color pieces are, are chintz, 50-50 cotton color. Those are the only fabrics I use in the quilts. So these two are different, a different pattern than the previous ones. This is a different pattern, and this is the same pattern that. Those really tall pieces are used. Rebecca, what made you do all these unusual shapes with the quilt rather than square? What made you do? Just a very creative and fun kind of thing, you know. I still do square quilts, but. Um, I went through a period where I just tried to get all kinds of different shapes and experiment making an interesting design piece using different angles. Um, oh yeah, well this is when, in 2001 I got into um, doing placemats and table runners and mug mats. I went to my gallery that I had in Taos called Clay and Fiber Gallery. Um, that, that they just specialized in those two things, clay pieces and fiber. And one of the employees said, you know, we don't have anything in the gallery for tabletop. Uh, so I thought, my gosh, I better Better start making that. So I went to a, a fabric store in Taos and, and bought some beautiful um, hand loom fabric from India uh, and just really took off with it. And it, that did really well for a long time. In fact, I still do a lot of table runners. And the mug mats, now that's, that's kind of like the, the side piece that really takes off. That was, those were scraps from making the table runners and mug mats. So I made now uh, probably about 24,000 mug mats. Oh. <laughs> and, and I still make, I work on them every day. I sell them individually, of course, and then a lot of them I put into as embellishments into the table runners and the deco bags and uh, wall hangings. This was some of the uh, fabric hand loomed in India. The stripes. And here's some um, modern day table runners. And you can see there's a mug mat right in the middle of each one is an embellishment. Mm -hmm. That was a, a commission uh, I did for a woman that, that was in 2022. Um, she had been in the fire that went across northern New Mexico and lost her home and the stuff in the home. So she had lost the table runner that I had made or that she bought at Tito's Gallery up there in Las Vegas. And so she went to Tito's and commissioned another one for her house that she was rebuilding up there in northern New Mexico. And there's some mud maps. <laughs> you know those. Yeah, and this, this piece is from a period that I did heavily embellished quilts. 
and that was in 2000 and 2001. I did about 17 of these pieces with um, just all kinds of beads and um, tool and unusual things sewn on them. That's another one. Yeah, I did. Worked on those for two years and I thought, you know, okay, I've done enough of those. <laughs> So that's one of the more modern pieces with some uh, embellishments. So this is one of the quilts that I made um, that I've been making in the last four years. Uh, oh, um, a while back I looked at a, a box up in the attic and I saw there were quite a few quilts that I had designed and cut out the pieces for, but then never made into the finished piece. And it was because back in the like the late 80s, I was designing them faster than I could actually sew the pieces together. So it kind of got a backlog in them. Mm -hmm. So there were, I don't know, there were over a dozen quilts. So I looked through all the patterns and I picked out the ones that would probably make a really interesting quilt. And so that's one of them. And the, I had already made the stripe pieces and cut out all the pieces. So I adapted it to my current style of using foil stamp fatigues and making the piece smaller, you know, half, less than half as big as what I had designed it for. So that's one of them. So this is a diptych. I went through a long period of making diptychs. <laughs> so this is um, Sheer Delight. That one's downstairs too. Here's another one. More common really to the ones that I really made a lot of and people would say, well, it looks like a vest, in front of a vest. So this is um, Sassafras. The quilt is called Sassafras, and I designed it in 1989, and sewed it, finished it in 1990, and it's just really one of my favorites it's in my living room. Um, so I was looking at it all that time, and I thought, oh, I could never figure out how to adapt that, but then I did. A couple of years ago, I adapted it to my current style, using stripes, like there, and then um, um, the batiks and brighter colors. So I've made five quilts since then using that sassafras pattern. So I call it the sassafras series. that for her living room so it's she sent me a picture of, of that in her living room and it's just like wow it's just you know how people are way up north you know they don't they don't have a lot of color they've got a lot of browns and woods and all that so even though that seems kind of muted that just really leaps out <laughs> she loves it and then this one this one I'm working on right now I don't even have a name for it yet um, and it's out there in the show-and-tell area. I'm, I'm just quilting it right now. So I didn't mention about the foil stamping. That's something I got into maybe 25 or more years ago. There was a woman in St. Paul that discovered that technique of adding sparkly colors to either uh, fabric or paper. Um, and so she taught a class in it, and I took the class, and 
I've been doing it ever since. Uh, I buy the, um, the raw materials from Screen Trans Company in, um, in New Jersey, so I order for those. I think they're the only company that makes that kind of uh, embellishment. So it's, it's a two-step process where you uh, apply the glue. It's a plastic uh, kind of thicky glue and then it dries overnight and then you can come back with a, sheets of foil and lay the foil over the dry glue and <coughs> use the edge of a hot iron to transfer the, the foil to the dry glue. It comes in many colors and you can see samples of that out there too. With the large quilts, for the borders, I would take one or two of the plastic templates pieces and then design, um, you know, the quilted border that goes around. And that's all hand quilted. And um, hand quilted? Yeah, yeah, they're all hand quilted. Rebecca, I saw you had a log book out there with patterns. Do you keep log books on all your... Quilts? Yeah, every quilt I have um, samples of the fabrics and then a notation of um, the color of the quilting thread, the number of pieces of the quilt, oh which pattern I used, and some other maybe wow. personal notes. Yeah. Well, first I studied astrology for two years at that same Minneapolis night school, and then, um, then I got into Tarot cards, I studied that too. And that was the late 70s, I got into Tarot. So I've been doing readings. Rebecca, did you go to Llewellyn? Did you go to Llewellyn? The I, downtown? I didn't, I didn't go there, no. I think maybe my friends. The um, bookstore and the people. Yeah, I had friends that yeah, connected there. <laughs> and my friends also went to the Mercury Academy to learn magic and um, astrology and card reading. So I learned from them too. I love what you have on today. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a, do you have a work schedule? Do you have time where you because everything is so organized, you work at a particular time. Well, yeah, I do. When I get up in the morning, which is usually um, by 7, I go out and sew for at least an hour in the back porch. And it's always cold out there. It's been in the 40s every morning or even more. So I'll do that for a while, and then I'll have breakfast. And, and then at night, too, that's what I do. You know, after five, after I've gone on my walk, usually I do uh, foil stamping. Almost every day I do foil stamping and then working on the mug mats and other parts of the whole process. The daytime is like for more of the businessy kind of thing, so I'm putting together an artist directory and <laughs> artist costume stuff. So. Oh, yes. When you go back up to Minnesota, do you take your entire works with you? <laughs> well, I did, yeah, when I used to go back and forth. You're not doing that anymore? No, I haven't been there for many years. Oh, I thought it was something you did regularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used but to. But you would transport everything. Well, I would. I mean, my computer and, of course, my sewing machine and um, fabric. And your, so and your Subaru. <laughs> yeah, one of the first Subaru, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does your schedule change during the baseball season? <laughs> well, 
Yes, uh, it doesn't so much, but I've always had my iPad there with the game on. <laughs> and with an iPad, you know, you can take it around and put it up right in front of the, in the sewing machine. <laughs> Because then the the foil goes off, and all you see is the the gray um, glue. But you could, I think, you can go back and put the foil back on the glue. <laughs> so it's just amazing that process that the screen trans uses. It's like a any old um, huge printing company with the. Uh, rolls of paper, you know, the wet press and all that. But that's done with uh, some yeah. oil. Yeah. So they apply the the glue and then they give it a heat sealing process. I suppose they put it someplace where it's really hot. I use foils in my book binding and it, the foils, which look very much like that, are already have a coating on the back that are heat sensitive and I use a stamper and it transfers. Oh, cool. So that's a different company you get that from? Oh, I, from all the foil companies that sell for bookbinding, you know, mm -hmm. or even commercial. Uh -huh. But I don't know how permanent it would be. I mean, I'm, I'm not throwing books in the wash. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you should. <laughs> but you, you should. I have lots of it if you want to try it. Sometime. Okay. Put the iron. So is that the same kind of foil that's used in Leo? Is it the same kind of artists use when they use gold foil? No, gold leaf is. That's gold leaf, yeah, different. Huh. Probably a lot more expensive. It probably is. <laughs> so this this comes on rolls, and you can see it out there. I brought some samples of some rolls that are mostly gone and then some of the paper or I mean the foil so you can see how you can part of it comes off when you so does it degrade with time if you don't use it the foil or yeah the glue or the foil no no cool yeah. and you can let it sit for um weeks or months before you get around to coming back to oh. transferring out. Yeah. Although it gets, if you wait like a year or so, it gets harder to transfer the foil. Yeah. 
So all that stuff is out there and you can take a look at it. Samples of it.